Okay, guys. Um, so as you can see, we had an argument yesterday in my one. So I'm going to do the talking today. Um, so we're going to talk about microservices, but not necessarily about all microservices. Who knows what microservices are? Maybe he knows what the concept is about. Who heard about Conway's law? There's not going to be anything about Conway's law. Conway's law. No, Conway's law. So, so the, the idea is that you might know what the idea is uh, of microservices. And we're going to focus on the ecosystem that we have built on top of microservices. Uh, and we're going to show you how difficult it is and, and why you shouldn't do it. Okay. So maybe a few words about us. So uh, my name is Marcin Grzeszczak. Uh, starting from today, I'm the principal software engineer at Pivotal. Uh, this is uh, Tomek Szymański, who is the co-founder of uh, Software Mill. This is, uh, these are our Twitter handles, so at Grzeszczak and at Shimano. And special thanks go to Łukasz Szczęsny, who is a very cool software engineer. His Twitter handle is at Vipchu, and all the infrastructure that you're going to see today uh, was provisioned by him, so uh, big round of, of applause to him. Thank you. Okay, so maybe uh, before we go there, uh, a bit of history. Why are we here uh, speaking together? We used to work at For Finance, where we have started a library which is open source, so you can download it. Uh, it's called Micro Infra Spring. And uh, we just wanted to answer a few questions uh, asked by the architects how these microservices are going to work. And uh, instead of just writing <coughs> answers, we wrote the library that tackled all those problems. And then Marcin took, took that library and he put it into Spring. So now it's part of the Spring Cloud, or maybe most of it is part of the Spring Cloud. So we're going to be showing you parts from Spring Cloud, uh, parts from Micro Infra Spring, but uh, in future, most of it should be should be put on Spring Source. Um, okay, so what we're gonna code today? Uh, this is a very simplistic <coughs> approach on brewing. Uh, so if you're into brewing beer, then probably you'll be laughing now. But um, on the top, you'll see uh, the presenting microservice. So we're gonna have four. The my presenting microservice is gonna be the only one that the user can actually interact with. So it has a UI, it has buttons, and it has gauges, and it has bars. So everything a enterprise application needs to have is on that top microservice. And then we have aggregating microservice. So what, what you start with, you order ingredients that then you're going to use for brewing the beer. And the ingredients are hop, malt, yeast, and water. And uh, the orders are sent to aggregator service, and the aggregator service go to some external services that are supposed to be providing those services, uh, those ingredients. Then once some threshold is met, these ingredients are going to be sent to the maturing microservice. And the maturing microservice is going to put everything in the, in the barrel and wait for the whole thing to mature. So once that is ready, everything will be sent to the bottling microservice. And bottling microservice will bottle the beer and will send the beers to some stock. and the bottling and maturing is implemented with a super sophisticated thread dot slip. Um, so we're going to see some, uh, some things waiting. Uh, and the uh, important part is that every, uh, every part of the business process is uh, reported back to the presenting microservice so we can see how many processes are maturing, how many processes are bottling, and so on. So enough talking. Yeah, right now we're going to do some serious coding. Yeah. So let's pray to the demo gods that it's going to work. Um, so what uh, Shimano is going to write is the part of the code that is uh, go going to be responsible for harvesting those uh, four uh, ingredients. So hop, malt, yeast, and water. Uh, everybody can see that? Is the font good? OK. So uh, here we have the super extra to-do sections. So in the first one, uh, as I said, uh, we're going to fetch uh, the ingredients. So if somebody clicked that he wants only water and hop, we're going to call only those two external services. Uh, since um, we want everything to be non-blocking, we're going to focus on uh, having all the listenable features and, uh, and stuff like that. Here you can see the types of ingredients. So it can be malt, water, hop, and yeast. Here's the actual order. So uh, 
this order comes in as a, as a request to the uh, controller and basing on the orders we get list of the services so if for example we have water then we're going to call the watering service uh, we're not going to go into the implementation details of that because it doesn't matter uh, anyways uh, since we're using uh, java 8 we have to do the streams uh, it's obvious uh, so Who's using java 8 and streams now hands up and the rest, and the rest? Is so this is groovy <laughs> Uh, so, uh, right now, for each of those uh, uh, ingredients, um, we're, we're going to call the harvest method. This is the syntax from uh, Java, Java 8. Uh, so, uh, we're going to convert um, the, the ingredient into a list of uh, futures. Uh, so, I'm going to talk slower, so Shimano can catch up. So, as you can see, what we get is like we're calling a service and we get a list of listenable futures because we don't want to block, right? Why should we? Because let's say we have a couple of pro uh, processes um, uh, waiting to finish. We, we sh uh, there's no need to block at the moment. So uh, this is a cool thing to do. So from a list of listenable futures, we can get a listenable future list. Why is it so? Because actually at some point you want to block. And we want to block uh, in such a way to retrieve the list of ingredients, right? So an order comes in, let's say somebody wants water and hop. So at the end of the day, we want a list of those ingredients, of water and hop. That's why we're doing all those listenable futures and changing a listenable future of list into the list of listenable futures. Uh, yeah, that was easy. Uh, why do we do futures? I already said that we're doing futures in order not to block. So, um, Soon Shimano will write the code if, we, uh, if he sees it with his one eye. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't make any mistakes, I wouldn't hit you, right? So <laughs> look, I forgot that uh, my left eye is weaker, so I can see. <laughs> I just okay, so right now uh, we, we can have such a case that uh, there is an exception when we call an external service to retrieve some water or hop or whatever, whatever. And then let's say that the business says, because always it's what business says, that if we have an exception, return some nil value, right? <laughs> because we love nil pointers. So let's assume that this is the case. So if there was any <coughs> exception in terms of calling some external services, let's uh, assume that there was a nil value. So we want to filter it out. And let's say that we managed to call hop, malt, and yeast. And at the end of the day, we want to add each of those ingredients to our warehouse. We're going to see the warehouse in a second. It's a very sophisticated concurrent hash map because, uh, yeah, databases are uh, too, too complex. So right now, uh, Shimano is writing a code that will do the request, the real HTTP request. Who is using Spring and REST template? Or oh, a couple of people. So uh, I guess that you love REST template. You know how uh, a great API it has. So what we build in Microinfra Spring is the uh, abstraction over a template. So a Fluent API where you can define that we want to send for an external service, so some service out there in the internet, you want to send a get message. So this is why you get the get with circuit breaker. Who knows his tricks? Okay, a couple of people do. So for the rest, circuit breaking is a concept uh, that, that is implemented by um, that the Hystrix library that we're using. And the idea of circuit breaking is such that if you're trying to call some service and it's dead, you don't want to endlessly try to call it because it's dead. So why uh, you will get exceptions, you will run out of threads in the thread pool, you don't want to block on those, uh, on <coughs> those calls. That's why his, uh, Hystrix and circuit breaking is used for that, that if the other side is dead, you don't want to send a request. You'll, let's say, assume that he's dead for some time, and then try again. That, uh, in this case, you will not uh, propagate exceptions further on. So if you haven't been using uh, circuit breaking uh, on the daily basis until now, after this talk, please check it out in more depth, because it will save you uh, when you're doing uh, distributed uh, systems. So we have the circuit uh, breaker there somewhere. Okay, so we're saying that uh, this, this lambda expression over there to the right says that if we cannot call the external service, if it's dead, what would you like to do? 
for example, if you had a, a case where you're checking if your client is a fraud, for example, the business uh, decision in, in this case, uh, when, when the fraud service is dead, would be, let's manually check the guy. This is the business de decision. <coughs> what should happen if the service you're calling is dead? In this case, as I said, we're returning just a null value. And then we're sending the request to some URL, uh, doesn't really matter. And what we want to uh, get at the end of the day is a uh, listenable future of ingredients. So by using this Fluent API, you can, uh, in a much more e easy way than my explanation, uh, send the HTTP request to the, the URL uh, with uh, circuit breaking and uh, with asynchronous retries. So what Shimano did right now is uh, start the application. Um, hopefully it will run. It did, almost. Yeah. So what about unit tests? <laughs> oh, come on. We've not, we've not even brought it. Yeah, you and the tests are there. We're TDD, so the tests are there already. Uh, so, <laughs> for the sake of the presentation, we're going to do manual testing. Uh, but of course, your, uh, your, your question is really, really bad. So, uh, who of you uh, is using a Postman or any other client to just send requests to test it? Okay, a couple of people. So, and who is using Swagger? Who knows this tool? Okay, quite a few people. So, for those who don't know, uh, Swagger is a tool uh, that is scanning your, um, your, your application in, in, in order to show you uh, your API that you have there in your application. So here, uh, we have an ingredients control. Can you magnify this a little bit? Okay. So here you can see an ingredients controller. So we can see that there is a, there is a post method at slash ingredients that you can call. Uh, there you have uh, this over there post with ingredients. This is the method in the code, distribute ingredients, and this is actually the name of the controller, so ingredients controller. Uh, this is the response that you're going to have, the response content type. Uh, can we change it? No, okay. And, and here you have the uh, headers that you can set. Uh, when you're doing distributed systems, it's very uh, important, not only in distributed systems, but in general, it's very important to version your API. Uh, but we'll get that to, to that in a moment. Here you have the default uh, header that you can set. And right now, Shimano is going to order the water uh, in the application. And he, when he clicked to try it out, a real request was sent to the working application. So right now, we can see that uh, we got 1,000 elements of water. And yeah, we can add it endlessly because we have a hash map underneath uh, to which we just add those elements. Uh, and we can add mold and etc. Et so it, actually what we did is that basing on the enum, we are ordering a thousand of something, like uh, either water, mold, cotton, yes. So this was the first feature because we are agile. So uh, <coughs> we had the one day sprint. So after this one day sprint, we decided that uh, we're going to just show the um, uh, let's say entries in the, in the warehouse that we have. So, can you go back to the main class to show the, uh, the other class? Ingrid, the, yeah, this one. So right now, if we go up, uh, here we can see that we're returning the current state. But we have a new feature. So if the state of our warehouse reaches some threshold value, like for example, 1,000, then it means that we have enough ingredients to start brewing the beer. So this is the part that uh, Shimano is going to code. So, Update if limit, limit reached, right? So if the limit was reached, then we can update the next service. Now the question is, where is this next service? And how can we call it? And what kind of API does it have? It's here. So, so right now Shimano went to the other service. It's the, uh, uh, the code of the other service. And here you can see uh, something which is a DSL of a tool called uh, Accurist. Accurist is the... So there's a there's a uh, top level top level directory called repository, and inside this repository you get such um, files. And now I'm actually looking at it. Thank you, Shimano. Thank you. So inside those files, you will see a description of the API that you have in your application. So here we are describing using a Groovy DSL uh, what should happen if a certain request with certain body is uh, uh, sent to the, uh, to the service. So we can see that if somebody says, uh, sends the request with a method post on the URL brew, 
with certain contents. You can see that we are versioning the API here with body like ingredients with some types like malt, malt hot water, hop, and yeast. Uh, then a, a response of 200 sh should be returned. Now, what is this creepy stuff? Who knows Groovy? Okay, not a lot of people, so don't worry. This is string interpolation. So instead of doing like string plus something plus string again, you can put it directly here. So uh, this is just information that um, certain things should happen for the stop and the test. What does it even mean? We have uh, created a DSL that uh, depicts the API. Uh, we want to use that in order to work with stops. So we, uh, if we are doing testing, we don't want to boot up the whole ecosystem, like my 100 microservices. We want to work with their stops. But we need to be sure that those stops are actually valid, so uh, that you're telling the truth. So from this contract that you have seen here, this Groovy DSL, two things will be created. One is the stub, and the other is the test. Because if you say that you have an endpoint slash foo, we will actually generate a test from this uh, uh, contract, and we will shoot at this foo endpoint to check if you're telling the truth. Because if you're lying, then we're going to break your build. Uh, this is the only way to ensure that we uh, that you're telling the truth and we can trust your stops. The thing is that if you're sending a real request to the real endpoint, you need a concrete value. Like, for example, send a thousand uh, items of water. So this is why we have in the test section a thousand, because for the test we need to send a real value. In the stops, however, uh, you don't want to fix for a value. Like, you just want to have a numeric value here. So if I'm uh, using your stops, I want your application, uh, your stop to respond properly, uh, regardless of the fact whether I said 100 or 1,000 or 10,000. That's why we have this distinction here. So right now we know that we can call uh, at slash brew the other service. So again, we have the service risk client. This is a, uh, a class that you have already seen. It's used in, uh, in the uh, micro infra spring library. So right now, uh, we want to call another service, but where the heck is it, right? Uh, we don't want to hard code ports and URLs because we wouldn't be able to scale. So this is why we have something called a microservice JSON file. In the spring of Zookeeper, uh, it's already a YAML file. So this is a microservice descriptor. So when I'm a microservice and I register myself, I register myself under certain realm. This is called, uh, in this case, it's PL. Uh, we needed that for finance because uh, we have like, different applications for different countries and we didn't want one country to call the services of the other country, right? Imagine if you make such a mistake with accounting or something like that. It's, it's going to be difficult to debug. So we want to split it by some namespace. And now we have the this section. This section means that I, when I boot up, I need to register somewhere in some service discovery under some name. This is the name, right? Together with the rep. And now, I, I'm going to call somebody, right? Some, some service. In this case, this is the uh, maturing service under the section dependencies. And you provide the path to the guy. So if you had another service that you want to call, you would have another value uh, uh, over here. This part, the, the, uh, this one, is an alias. So I don't want to, each time in the code, provide a long path uh, in order to call this guy. So we have a small, a small alias called like Deutsche Bach in this case. So this is a microservice descriptor. It tells you how you need to register and when, where your dependencies are. All of those dependencies register in Zookeeper. Zookeeper is a service discovery and uh, uh, registration uh, service. And right now, you can see that we're sending a request for service in a second, again, <laughs> called Deutsche Bach. This is the thing that you saw in the microservice uh, descriptor. So this is an alive. So we're sending uh, a post message, because in the Groovy DSL, we could see that the URL was post. We have some circuit breaking. Uh, so again, we're using Hystrix. Please remember about using a circuit breaking. Seriously, uh, when you're going, you're scaling uh, with your uh, applications, with your system, if you're not using fail-fast approach, if you're not uh, using circuit breaking, uh, at the end of the day, your whole system can blow up because it's going to 
uh, let's say, endlessly wait for uh, resources that will never be free because the, the, your, your, your whole system is timing out. So we're sending a post message with circuit breaker on URL brew. Uh, we're sending some ingredients, believe us, they are proper. And we're, since we're versioning the API, we have the content type of version 1 of the maturing service. Since we don't care about the response, we're not blocking here at all, we're just returning, uh, uh, we're ignoring the response and it's done in an asynchronous way so we get the listenable future here as well. So let's, uh, yeah, let's take a look at the versioning. Here you can see that we have version 1 of the maturing service. Please remember about versioning your API and don't do backwards incompatible changes. There's one side note here. Uh, for finance, we had one a case where somebody wanted to fix a typo in the API because of the Boy Scout rule, right? So he went to a request, he fixed the typo, and he didn't tell anybody of the consumers of that API that the typo was fixed. And you can imagine how many exceptions were thrown because all the consumers were expecting, like, sending a typo deliberately. So please do not change, uh, like do not do backwards incompatible changes uh, in your API. Okay, so right now let's check it out if it's still working. So Shimano has coded the feature that uh, if we have met a certain threshold in the application, uh, 1,000 of all the ingredients, then uh, let's say the uh, the request should be sent to the maturing service, and we can uh, try it out again. Who thinks, because remember, we're, we haven't booted up anything but this service and there is no zookeeper, as you could see. There's no service discovery, uh, let's say, um, set up by us uh, by hand. Who thinks that this is going to blow? Because it should, because you're sending a real request to something that is not existing. Who thinks it's going to blow? Nobody, because it makes no sense, because we're doing a demo. Of course, uh, why is it not going to blow? You can see that we have, uh, uh, because first Shimano uh, ordered only three ingredients, so we, have, uh, uh, we had 1,000. Then he ordered all four ingredients, that's why it was uh, like uh, decreased by 1,000. That's why we have 2000, uh, 1,000 for everything but the last part. Why didn't it blow up? Because what happens is that in memory, uh, we are starting the zookeeper for you, so as a developer you don't even have to think about this. And the other thing is that Microinfra Spring, so the library that we are uh, talking about, is uh, automatically downloading uh, stops for your application. So if you say that you're talking to a service called ABC, we're going to download the stops for this application. So if you want to work as a developer in a dev mode with your application, all the surrounding world of your microservice will be stopped. So you don't have to set up gazillions of services. You can have it isolated, like unit tests. Uh, so this is why it's not going to blow up. So uh, right now, let's say we coded the functionality. Let's go uh, to Jenkins, because we need to deploy it to production as soon as possible. So this is the Jenkins setup that we have. Who is using Jenkins and loves to click the uh, jobs by hand? You love to click the jobs? <laughs> Seriously? So, whatever you see, I mean, everything you see here is done from code. But not random by hand. Create them by hand. Create them, click. So you have to create the whole pipeline manually. Nobody likes that. So all the jobs, all the pipelines that you see here in front of you were created from the code. So there is a, uh, there is a uh, project called Jenkins DSL, it's a plugin for Jenkins, that you can define using a groovy DSL the jobs that you want to have. So actually once in our, uh, in our company I asked the developer to delete four jobs, only four. But he like, misunderstood what I said and he deleted all the jobs but those four. <laughs> so, you know, it's like a, it's a, well, there was an exploration mark in, in, in front of the contents. So, we got all the jobs and there were like hundreds of jobs in, in a minute because we had them all coded. Here is an example, can you modify this a little bit? Uh, here is an example of a job called build uh, that uh, this injects some passwords and masks them. 
these are the triggers. So if somebody does a push or uh, from GitHub, or we are pulling uh, each minute for changes, we are appending Slack notifications. We're going to see them in a second, and we're executing the clean build publish Gradle command or whatever. So check out Jenkins DSL. Uh, if you're uh, going to do it once, you're never going to come back to let's uh, say manual click. So here you can see a. Uh, pipeline for uh, microservices, let's say we build uh, the application here because we don't have much time, there is just echoing in the, in the back, but in general there would be some testing. Uh, and we're deploying the current version to uh, production. We can even show you a fancy hipster UI to show that, you can put it on the TV screen. Actually, I'm laughing a little bit because of that, but it's very cool to have uh, such a thing in your team because you will instantly see that somebody deploys your application to production and that maybe you're going to have problems in a, se in a second or not. So here you can see that the application was deployed to production. Uh, and let's uh, check it out. So this is the, uh, the brewing panel. This is the presenting service. Uh, uh, to the left you can see the, see the stock of the ingredients. So for the water, hot, malt and yeast. Here you can order those ingredients, and here you have the items being uh, matured, items being uh, bottled, and this is the total number of bottles. Uh, on production we have the threshold uh, set to 5300 if I'm not mistaken. So right now, after this click, it should drop, yes. So right now we have uh, the aggregating service uh, returned his current state, here we can see that the, there is one brewing process, uh, taking part, a maturing process, uh, uh, the sleep has ended, now we have the uh, bottling process, I think we have 30 seconds of sleep here, so I have to talk about something, maybe let's show Spring Boot Admin Server in the meantime. Um, okay, our applications are Spring Boot based, we have four of them, so you can have a, a very nice uh, console to see what kind of applications you have are there on production. This is called Spring Boot Admin Server. Uh, we have all those four, uh, four applications here. You can see from which branch and uh, what's the commit uh, ID of the, uh, of the deployed application. And you can see in more depth the details of the application. So you can see the metrics, you can see the JVM stats, maybe not so fast. <laughs> we have uh, uh, we have the information about uh, garbage collection, uh, everything that you, you have uh, like in the actuator in script. You can change the environment variables, you can see what kind of those variables are, uh, variables are there. You can change the logging levels, uh, you have access to the JMX console, you can do a dump of threads. I mean, we're going to leave it for like a day or so, all those uh, th things that you see today and you can click around and play for yourself. So, uh, we had 400 something bottles, right now we have 5,200 uh, 5, bottles, so the whole application is working, thank God. So right now, Shimano is going to do some hardcore ordering of beers, so there's going to be plenty of stuff in the process. So, the next thing that we can, uh, we can show you uh, is uh, history. So right now, you can see four commands being sent here. These are the commands uh, that are wrapping the uh, execution of uh, uh, commands to the external services. You can see the green dot here signifying the amount of requests. Uh, actually, uh, the health is very good because the circuit is closed. Uh, we don't have time to like break the circuit, but you could see if the other service would be down, you would see that there's an increasing number of red uh, the integers here, and that Hystrix has uh, closed the circuit for you. Okay, let's go, because we don't have much time, unfortunately, let's go maybe to uh, Kibana. So, look, at, look uh, collecting. You're not, if you have like 10,000 instances, you don't want to SSH to each server, grab the logs and uh, check for exceptions. What you can have is Kibana. Kibana is the UI over uh, uh, collected logs. And a very important thing is a correlation, uh, correlation ID. Correlation ID is a concept that whenever you have a business request, for example, hopping uh, over 50 services, for example, client wants to register, there should be the very same uh, ID for all of those hops. Why? Because then you can pick one of those correlation IDs 
click here. You can click one of those correlation IDs, and in a chronological order, you can see uh, the uh, order of requests. Okay, so uh, here now you can see that we have one correlation ID. This is one value. And can you, uh, let's go from the bottom. So first we're doing an order, four items are there. Then we have match the threshold. We're, uh, we were in the presenting service, then we are in the aggregation service. Then uh, aggregation service is calling back the presenting service. Then we have a maturing service and bottling service. So all the four services are there. This is the, actually the only way you can, in a fast manner, debug your distributed system. Uh, as you can see, we didn't SSH the single machine. We have logs in one place. Uh, another thing that is really important are the metrics, because we need to measure the KPIs, so the key performance indicators of our systems. Here we have a tool called Grafana, which is the UI over the uh, metrics that we have. Here to the left, uh, you can see the um, amount of ingredients that we had over time. You can do a very sophisticated statistical analysis if you need so. Uh, for us, let's say the uh, indicator that something is wrong if it is in the system is when, uh, for example, some amount of ingredients has dropped significantly. Here you can see the uh, mean, fifth, uh, mean rate from the last 15 uh, minutes of the maturing processes, and this is the count of bottles over time. The, the key thing is to have uh, alerting over your metrics. So if, for example, something happens in the system, you need to know this as soon as possible. So this is a tool called Siren. This is a buzzword bingo, so somebody should have already won. Uh, you can go to the checks section on the top uh, level here, and you will see uh, that we have certain alerts, for example, yeast alert, which means that if the yeast uh, is uh, below uh, the value of 1,000, please warn me. If it's below the number of 500, it's an error, right? So we have, uh, uh, let's say, one, in one place, we have all the information about uh, our applications. It's called, uh, this place is Slack. So here, oh, where is the, there's no uh, uh, grumpy cat here, there should be grumpy cat. So Graphica says, uh, tells us that, for example, there was a change in the state. So we had three, thank you, we had 300, uh, 3,500 uh, elements of water. Uh, so we changed from error to OK. You need to have immediate feedback of your KPIs if you want to go uh, uh, towards the distributed systems. Another thing that we have is the feedback from Jenkins. Uh, when Shimano clicked rebuild, we got immediate information from Jenkins that somebody uh, started the build. We can see, because we, don't, we don't have any tests, so we could not see that, uh, but we would know what kind of tests uh, failed if there was an exception. Uh, or, uh, yeah. uh, I told you about service discovery and registration. This is Zookeeper, exhibitor for Zookeeper. Zookeeper, Zookeeper is a service discovery and registration. Uh, tool. Exhibitor is the UI over this that governs the cluster of zookeepers. Here you can see this path that I told you about, like PL, your services ag aggregator, and here is the ID of a single instance. If you would scale and have 50 instances of this application, you would have 50 IDs here. And at the end of the day, uh, it is resolved to an address and port over here to the bottom, right? So when you're calling, like, give me an uh, application called X, at the end of the day you get address and port. Uh, another very important thing is uh, Zipkin. Twitter Zipkin. So, uh, when you're doing distributed tracing, uh, you need to know uh, how much time did an application uh, take uh, sorry, how much time did an application take uh, to uh, execute the uh, a request. Okay. Uh, so here you can see, uh, for example, the uh, time of execution of a single request for an aggregation service. So when you click on this, you can you can see that uh, what, what kind of uh, uh, headers were there. Uh, I want to show you one more thing, but of course, demo gods are not happy with us today. Uh, maybe this one. Of course not. Oh, okay, because you have it open all the time. Where is the uh, application? Turn it off. Um, 
So uh, when you have, for example, Firefox and you're uh, pressing F12 in your uh, browser, you can see like which resource in your application took what, uh, how much uh, of time uh, to, um, to, uh, to 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 let's say process. Oh, we're going to show it to you later. Of course, the demo gods are not happy. So uh, another really important thing is that uh, you can see the um, in your system, the dependencies between applications. So in Microinfra Spring, uh, we created a collaborator's view, which, uh, let's say, uh, sketches this sort of a map, showing you which application communicates with which one. The cool thing is that you can drag and drop that, the circle gets bigger. Uh, but the most important thing is that immediately you can see that there's something really wrong with your application when you have like a sun architecture, that everybody is calling a single application. So this is something that comes together with Microinfra. It should be quite soon, hopefully, also in Spring uh, Club. So uh, let's maybe go back to the presentation, because I think that's pretty much it. We don't have one lot of time, unfortunately. Um, play from starts. Yeah. So this was what you just saw. We didn't want to show it to you immediately, because you would uh, say get, get out immediately from the room. So we had Jenkins that was building applications. Rundeck was actually something you didn't see. It was a tool that was deploying the application to the uh, to the server. Uh, yeah. Uh, then uh, all the applications are uh, were using configuration stored in Git. The logs were aggregating using the Elastic Search Log stash Kibana stack. The graphite was aggregating uh, metrics. Here you had the Zookeeper that we showed you for service registration and discovery. And we had Zipkin, Spring Boot Admin Server, Slack, Histrix, and Zynga that we didn't uh, have the opportunity to show you. Now let's go to the summary. <coughs> there we go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so microservices are complex, and um, it's not going to be easier if you start using microservices. It might be easier to tackle your business problems, but it's more difficult to develop, obviously. Um, and uh, what we have discovered is that it doesn't work. Okay, so um, if you don't like talking to people in your organization, then if you introduce microservices, it's going to be even more difficult because you have to talk a lot more with different people because you're going to depend more on their code, on their APIs, on their systems, to uh, the microservices to be deployed and so on. So first. You should fix your communication problems, issues, and then you can go with the microservice approach. Um, so, yeah, so you, you need to put a lot of automation. You cannot just have a developer doing 10% of the DevOps time. You probably need a separate team of DevOps, and might be bigger than the developers actually, because they have a lot of work to make this whole thing automated. Um, so you can create new microservices easily and so on and so on and test them. And um, yeah, so then you have to use a lot of different technologies that you didn't have to use with Monolith and I have one minute left, so that's perfect, thank you. Um, and so we've shown you plenty, there is a lot, lot more, uh, they come in different flavors but the, you, you're going to need that functionality that we just showed you. Uh, and yeah, collecting metrics and logs, very important to know what's happening in your microservices net uh, so that you can pull up, pull up things and so on if you need to. Uh, and then double clicks again. Yeah, and then if there's a new tool, uh, you might be tempted to just start using it, that you, you should always think twice or three times. What are, what are the, the, what's the impact of introducing it, what's the uh, cost, and what, what you're going to get. So uh, think ab about that every time. And questions? We have time for questions. Yeah. Three more minutes. Three four minutes. Okay. Yeah, uh, question, uh, taking into account you're already having some experience with, with all these other tools, how much time you estimate for some completely new project to set up all this infrastructure? Okay, so we made it easy for you. Okay, so I'm gonna sh sh show this slide so you can. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the answer. 
Okay, um, everything that we've shown you, all this setup is provisioned, as, as Martin said, with Ansible. So, if you want to start from a greenfield project using microservices, then you can just take our GitHub and then start from that. So that will be easier for you. You don't have to do everything from scratch. So you have provisioning scripts that will allow you to, like, with just one, one, one uh, execution of a script to provide all, like, the majority of the things that we showed you. So coming back to, uh, to your question, we had a team, eight months, doing the library. And there were quite a few DevOps doing the provisioning scripts also for a, for a year or something. But for uh, right now, it's, everything is open source, so uh, you don't have to do it. There you go. I have a really stupid question. So don't ask. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so uh, does microservices pattern always mean that you have to have physically separate services that do separate JSON response and it has to be hosted separately? But you could just... Uh, use logical separation to obtain the same microservices. Just collaborate them all in memory via method calls. Uh, and how will you like embed those uh, parts of the application in, in, in one thing, like one thing deployable unit? If you, if you embed those things, then you're de depending on, for example, libraries, the language, and stuff like that. So basically, if you have them separate, uh, the, created separately, uh, you don't have, you're not depending on each other, right? So if you change the method call, uh, I mean, my application will immediately break, right? And uh, in this approach that we showed you, uh, for, for example, you can prohibit from such things to happen because you can, for example, break the build if you're doing the, uh, let's say, backwards incompatible changes. But this is more of a philosophical question, so maybe let's uh, have it after, the, uh, after this talk. There was a question from you, I guess? Oh, uh, yeah, about the... Thing you said, okay, let's provision it. Yes. But then, if it's our first project and we have an infrastructure, we don't understand that. that maybe it's better for the first time for the team to set up uh, themselves. So, we do trainings. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's obviously a lot of new things to learn. As we mentioned before, microservices are complex, and there's a lot of extra work that you need to put to be uh, you know, proficient with, with them. So and the question is if you, really, uh, if you really need them, actually, right? If you're just uh, like, uh, creating a new project, you shouldn't like, say, OK, let's do microservices. First, you have to ask yourself, do I have the capacity to do them? If I, if I have the expertise, if I have the people, if the, what kind of problems do I want to solve with microservices? Because the problems don't disappear, they go up to the architecture level. So uh, it's going to be even more difficult to debug stuff. You have to use correlation IDs, you have to use, uh, let's say, uh, stuff like that. Whereas if you have everything in, in one place, then you can debug, like, you, you know, in your ID. So it's much, much easier. So you have to, like, uh, ask yourself, what, what, what is the benefit of going towards the microservices? Okay, are there any more questions? No questions. Okay, so thank you very much. And here you can see the documentation. Uh, also, the, the GitHub uh, organization where you can find all the code. Uh, we're going to leave it until the end of the day, I guess, uh, running, so you can click it around. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So you, you can find us, ask us questions. And, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's cool.